So you have a coding interview coming up and you need to start preparing? Well, it's only natural that a data structure course that you took in uni is pretty much just a distant memory by now, or maybe you didn't even take that class to begin with. Well, either way, I got you covered. In this video, I'm going to cover most of the data structures that you need to know to properly solve coding questions. And you know what? It's not too difficult. So let's get straight into it. First of all, what is a data structure? A data structure is a format that organizes a collection of data points in a way that makes accessing and modifying these points more convenient and or more efficient. The top data structures that you need to know and will be covered in this video are arrays and strings, linked lists, hash tables, stacks and queues, graphs and trees, and lastly, heaps. If you know these ones, you are like 98% covered. Uh, there are more advanced data structures that I will leave out for a different video. But again, just knowing these basic ones will be sufficient for most coding interviews. Okay, so we start with the most basic data structure there is, the array. An array is a set of elements stored continuously in memory. You can have an array of integers, an array of floats, an array of custom structures, or any other type you can think of. Arrays of characters are so useful that they have their own name. They're called strings. So strings are just a special, very useful type of arrays. The best thing about arrays is the fast access by index operation. Accessing an array at index 2 and accessing it at index 2 million will require the same amount of operations. The reason is that the elements are stored in consecutive memory locations. So to access index 2, all you have to do is add 2 to the starting address and jump straight to the right location. You don't need to walk over each element along the way. That is one add operation. To access index 2 million, you add 2 million to the starting address and jump to the right location. Again, no need to walk over 2 million elements. When the number of operations is a small constant that does not depend on the number of elements, we say that the time complexity is constant, also known as O of 1. Arrays provide the fastest access by index. You will not be able to top it with any other data structure. The problem with arrays is that they are very bad at inserting and removing elements. For example, if I had to insert a value at this position, I would have to shift all other n elements one spot to the right. So for an array of 50 elements, I would have to perform around 50 shift operations. For an array of 2 million elements, I would have to perform around 2 million operations. When the number of operations grows linearly with the number of elements, we say that the time complexity is linear, also known as O of n, which is a very bad time complexity for this simple task. Linked lists, on the other hand, are very good at inserting and removing elements. I'll show you exactly why in a second, but first, what is a linked list? A linked list is comprised of nodes. A node is a small structure that has a value and a next pointer pointing to the next node in the list. The last next pointer will have the value of null, indicating that this is the end of the list. If I had to insert a value here, I would just need to adjust these two next pointers. It doesn't matter how long the list is, it could have a million nodes after this one. The number of operations will not be affected, which means a constant time complexity. Now what about accessing an element at a specific index? We'll notice that these nodes are not in consecutive memory locations. So unlike the array, there is no way to compute the address of element n from the address of the first node. This first node is not even aware of any of the other nodes, it only knows which one is next. So if we wanted to access the element at index n, we can't jump straight to it. We have to iterate over n pointers. That is worst case O of n operations. Next data structure is probably the most useful one, the hash table. I can almost guarantee that you will need it in your interview. A hash table is a collection of key value pairs, for example, a person's ID as the key and a person's name as the value. The keys are unique and can be used as if they were indices of an array. So for example, this expression, we return the value John because the value for key 2 is John. This is very useful because unlike the array's index, which has to be a positive integer from a known range, the hash table's key can be anything. It can be a negative number, it can be a floating point number, it can even be a string. So how does it work? Under the hood, we have an array and a function called a hash function. When we insert a key value pair to the table, the key is pushed into the hash function. This function will output an index, also known as a hash code, and the value is stored in that index. So for example, in this case, we can choose the hash function to be the identity function, f of key equals key. And then when we go to insert this element, the key 2 is pushed into the hash function, which returns the value 2, so this element will be stored in index 2. The hash code for key 4 will be 4, so this element will be stored at index 4. It works well for now, right? But what if I also add this element? Now the array has to be huge, it has to have more than 2 million cells. So uh, one possible solution for this is to change the hash function from key to key mod 5. 
the mod operation returns the remainder of a division. So, uh, for example, 2 mod 5 is 2 because that is the remainder when dividing 2 by 5. Uh, so the hash code for key 2 is still 2, which means that John stays at index 2. 4 mod 5 is 4, so Sam also stays at his current index. Uh, and finally, 2 million mod 5 is 0, moving Bob from index 2 million to index 0. And now the array can go back to be of size 5. So we fixed one problem, but now what if I also add this element? The remainder of dividing 0 by 5 is 0, and we already have an element at index 0, right? That is called a collision. And the way we usually deal with collisions is for each cell, we keep a list of all the elements that map to this cell. And then when we want to retrieve an element, we would first get to the right location using the hash function, and then we would iterate the list to find the right key. Now, a few words about the time complexity. Think what would happen if all the next n elements would map to this same cell. Finding a key that maps to this cell would require O of n operations because we would need to iterate a list of size n. But don't worry, because a good hash function will distribute the elements fairly evenly, and more importantly, it is not up to us to come up with it. We can assume that the underlying implementation chose a good enough hash function that will keep the number of collisions to a minimum, and deal with them in the most optimal way. This will provide us very fast access by key, remove, and insert operations, which will take us, in average, constant time. Next, we have stacks and queues. You can think of these structures as linked lists with a more limited set of operations. The internal implementation doesn't actually have to be linked lists, but for simplicity, we can assume that it is. Think of how you would stack plates. You add new plates to the top, and then when you need to use one, you take the one on top, the last plate that was added to the stack. This is called LIFO, last in, first out. Now think of a queue of people standing in line to the pharmacy. When a new person joins the queue, he will stand at the end of the line. The person that gets served first and leaves the queue is the one that got there first. So the first person that was added to the queue. That is called FIFO, first in, first out. So in both stacks and queues, you can only insert elements to the end of the list. You can't insert anything to the beginning, middle, or anywhere else. The time complexity for this insertion is just like a linked list, it's constant. In a stack, you can only remove the last element that was added to it, so the element at the end of the list. In a queue, you can only remove the first element that was added to it, the element at the beginning of the list. Again, complexity is just like that of a linked list, constant. Next, we have graphs. Actually, we've seen one type of graph already. A linked list is a very specific type of graph where each node connects to only one other node. In the general case, a node can connect to any number of nodes. The total number of nodes in a graph is usually denoted by V. V stands for vertices, which is just another word for nodes. The number of edges is E for edges. The edges can be directed or undirected. You can think of an undirected edge as two directed ones, one in each direction. Some graphs may also have weights on their edges. Weights can represent cost, distance, capacity. It depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Graphs are usually implemented with adjacency lists. You have an array of size V, so a cell for each node, and then for each cell, you have a list of nodes that this node connects to. So in this example, uh, node 0 has outgoing edges to nodes 1, 2, and 3. Node 1 has outgoing edges to nodes 1, 0, and 2. Node 2 connects to node 3 and 4. Node 3 connects to node 4 and node 4 has no outgoing edges. So this array of arrays represents this graph and this graph only. Another specific type of graph is a tree. An easy way to understand trees is to think of org charts. Every organization has one CEO and that will be the root of the tree. The CEO would have uh, some number of direct reports and then each of them may have their own direct reports and so on. So everything flows in one direction. Now, what if I also add this edge? Well, this is no longer a tree because a node in a tree can only have one incoming edge. But instead of memorizing rules, just think of the org chart example. An employee cannot have two direct managers, right? So this org chart will not make sense. Graphs and trees are great for describing networks, dependency relationships, hierarchies, and more. There's a whole world of graph algorithms. You can spend years studying just that. But fortunately, most coding interview questions will boil down to just small variations of BFS and DFS. BFS and DFS are both algorithms used to traverse graphs. We can talk about them in a different video that focuses more on algorithms as opposed to data structures. And now to our last data structure of this video, the very useful heap. A heap can either be a max heap or a min heap. Here we have an example of a min heap. Heaps are usually visualized as trees, although they are commonly implemented with arrays. But there's really no need to get into those kind of details. All you need to know is this. 
the top value in a mean heap will always be the minimum value in the heap. The top value in a max heap will be the maximum value in the heap. Therefore, retrieving the maximum mean value will take constant time because all you have to do is look at the roots value. Inserting a new value to the heap will take log n time. Without going into too much detail, this time complexity is a function of the height of the heap. Now removals. You can only remove the top element of a heap. So in a max heap, you can only remove the maximum value. In a mean heap, you can only remove the minimum value. This will also take log n time. Again, it's a function of the height of the heap. So heaps are very useful for problems that require accessing the mean or max value very quickly and very frequently. Okay, so we are done. Now you know most of the data structures that you might need in your interview. I hope this video helped you out. If it did, please leave it a like or a comment and consider subscribing for more content like this. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time.